I'm showing you some pictures while I talk. Um, my talk is composed of a brief introduction, a backstory, a discussion of three cross-cultural productions, a further analysis of the bifurcation of audience, and a conclusion. Um, I call my introduction the interstice between the old and the new, uh, to, to, to discuss in what way our reception of Shakespeare has been mediated by the media, we usually have in mind film, television, games, manga, and other new forms of media. However, there are some media products that combine imported plots with traditional arts that are revived to be cultural carriers in an age of globalized theater. Some of my Korean students revealed to me the shamanistic elements in some Korean adaptation of Hamlet. I'm not familiar with shamanism, uh, but I can imagine Hamlet has been endowed with the power of Korean culture and therefore ideas about life and death in that adaptation appeal to the Korean audience in a different light. And when I was introduced to the not adaptation of Othello in Japan, I could sense the Japanese or Asian flavor that so subtly brings out the lamentable transients of life and beauty of Desimona. Likewise, the Chinese classical theater, known as Qi Chu, has a rich storage of conventions, allusions, and metaphors that some, some motifs of classical dramatic li literature have been encoded in the visual forms. Today, when the traditional theater is carried forward, to meet the modern media and the imported literature. The result is often a mixture of Western themes, Xichu conventions, and different types of audience on a platform that is both national and international. And this presentation discusses three of the Chinese productions that vet Shakespeare <coughs> with Xichu and are oriented to those both international uh, audience and Chinese nationals. It argues with examples that the cross-cultural adaptations as media products provide new interpretive perspectives, but also suggest different meanings to the bifurcated audiences. There's a rooted belief in Chinese theater that the word often fails, but there is the image to bring out more meanings. <coughs> in Chinese. Perhaps the counterpart of the idiom, a picture is worth a thousand words. The dramatic theory of the mutuality between image and word can be traced back to I Ching, the early canon of philosophy. If we approach the adaptations on stage rather than on page, we'd be immediately impressed by the visual effects. Besides the exotic, oriental feeling, the images and visual effects are evocative of the encoded meanings. So the next part reviews briefly the reception of Shakespeare in China as the backstory of the discussion in focus. Uh, Theatres in the Ming Dynasty China and Renaissance England developed and prospered respectively on their own courses without any mutual influences. Um, Shakespeare and Tang Xianzu, two contemporaries, provoked academic interest to relate one to the other as early as, if not earlier than, Aoki Masori's, uh, I don't know if my pronunciation is good, um, a history of Chinese drama in the Ming and Qing dynasties in Japanese in 1930. Uh, a Chinese scholar, Zhao Jingsheng's Tang Xianzu and Shakespeare in 1946. Shakespeare in China had a history of about a century and a half. Since the introduction of the Bard into Chinese culture, there has been a strong bond and, subtle, and su some subtle tensions between Shakespeare and the Chinese tradition. 
Shakespeare's presence in China exceeded the specific meanings in his works from the very beginning. His arrival coincided with the intellectual pursuits for cultural reform that started in the late Qing Dynasty. Um, a literary work, um, I, I quote Liao's, a literary work, even when it appears to be new, does not present itself as something absolutely new in an informational vacuum. It holds very true for the history of Shakespeare in China. In publications that introduced the Western cultures in the mid and late 19th century, produced by Christian missionaries and Chinese intellectuals, Shakespeare was lauded and gradually adopted as the model of Western values. Meanwhile, there were no faithful translation of his plays for dozens of years, and the project for translating the complete works of Shakespeare into Chinese was initiated only in the 1930s. That's why I was so in, interested in Professor Gallimore's talk just now. Um, since the earlier, uh, since the early 20th century, soon after the early introduction of Shakespeare into China, directors had attempted to blend Shakespeare and Chinese traditional opera, using Chinese opera to familiarize Shakespeare or weaving Shakespeare into the dramatic tradition of China. Shakespeare's plays have been adopted to Kun opera, Peking opera, Yue opera, Huangmei opera, Guangdong Yue opera, there are two Yue's, Tanzi and other varieties of Chinese operas. It seemed, it seemed that a play geared at, towards a traditional Chinese mindset might appeal readily to the common people. Now, to save time, I'll only discuss three examples from the three cross-cultural productions. Um, that part is called the visual imagination in the three productions. The th uh, three productions in the last 30 years may catch our attention, for they have been popular among both Chinese and international audiences. Two opera productions of Hamlet may be two of the most popular opera productions of Shakespeare in Chinese mainland. The Peking opera adaptation, which is called The Revenge of Prince Zi Dan, uh, Zi da Dan is the Chinese counterpart for Denmark. You see the pronunciation is similar. <coughs> Zi is the, um, a phrase to show respect and to call a, a gentleman, Zi Dan, which was premiered in 2005 and performed in 13 countries in the last dozen years. And the Yue opera adaptation, Hamlet, which was produced in 1994 for the International Shakespeare Festival in Shanghai. Among the Hua Ju, that's the uh, uh, modern drama adaptations influenced by the Western theater, among the Hua Ju adaptations of Shakespeare, Richard III, produced by the National Theatre of China and directed by Wang Xiaoying, is one of the most internationally applauded productions. It was premiered at the London Globe during the 2012 Globe to Globe Festival and was revived for international and Chinese audiences. I just heard it even here, it, it was performed in Seoul several years ago. Glad to know that. All three adaptations reset the stories in ancient China, and each has made some drastic changes in stage effects or moral values. They have exemplified how Shakespeare's scripts are distorted and shoehorned into the Chinese style, and especially the Xi Chu style. The two productions of Hamlet have been shown on television, and they are available in DVD format, and popular on the internet. The production of Richard III is available on the internet and it has been revived several times. What is worth noticing is that the leading actors of the two Hamlet productions, Yue opera for Hamlet and Peking opera for uh, The Revenge of Prince Zidane, they, they have both become popular with the young audience, mainly university students. 
the actor of Peking Opera Hamlet often gave talks to uh, university students. Richard III was performed in the theater of Tsinghua University, my university, the year before. And this director is keen to meet university students. Um, now I will mainly focus on three examples and try to talk briefly. Though the modern drama adaptation of Richard III followed the play closely, I'm quoting a journalist in, in its lines, in style it highlights Chinese the theatrical aesthetics with the typical stage props of one table and two chairs, as well as the tone of Peking opera singing and Xi masks. What is most impressive in the visual images on stage is the willpower that makes history and makes the man both a hero and a villain. Richard III shows high martial skills, though he occasionally hunches and twitches when he's left alone. In the battle scenes, he has a confident and commanding presence. Making love to Lady Anne, he moves around her swiftly as if on wings. Images of square bird calligraphy, and these are the square bird calligraphy. Did you realize that it is actually the English word having, that part is for A, H, and then A, or V, I, N, G. So all these are Chinese English words. <laughs> this is a method of writing English words in rectangular arrangements that resemble Chinese characters. Um, they were devised by a Chinese calligrapher called Xu Bing. So the key words like desire, war, a horse were shown on the backdrop, the back curtain, decorated with lions that look like blood, these lines, like blood, tears, and a river. With the visual elements arouses the imagination of the endless time and boundless space, reminiscent of the universal cycle of life and death. In that context, the central character appears to be ambitious, pathetic, but more heroic than monstrous. The final scene of Henry's enthronement, corresponding to the enthronement of Richard III in the previous scene, alludes immediately to a Chinese idiom. The winners become kings and the losers criminals or sinners. That's a Chinese counterpart of history of written by winners. Well then, in the second adaptation, second production, the Peking Opera adaptation of Hamlet, The Revenge of Prince Zidane, the ghost of old Hamlet is brought up to the human world by the God of Justice, who speaks the opening lines in the form of self-introduction. That's a convention in traditional Chinese opera. He says, I am God of Justice from the underworld. The king of Chichou, uh, Chi means the red, the red castle, was murdered. Since his sins have not yet been purged, he's a prisoner in a burning hell in daytime and a roamer in the human world at night. Now bring out the, his soul, his ghost, to our secular world. So in Shakespeare's version, when Horatio, Marcellus, and Bernardo refer to the ghost in an ambiguous manner, using words like fantasy, dreaded sight, apparition, and illusion, Shakespeare's original audience would be impressed with the prolonged mystery, uncertainty, and suspense. However, in this opera adaptation, the god of justice is a new character derived from Chinese folklore. Um, as you can see in the picture, the god's look is strikingly impressive. His ghostly, with ruffled hair, deformed body, and weird movements, the image of the god of justice is a moral metaphor, personifying the omniscient justice and his power for ferocious revenge. Uh, this god is present when the ghost meets his son, which actually guarantees the vanity of the story told by the ghost. 
Since the very beginning, the fascinating ambiguity about the ghost in Shakespeare's original is lost. An omniscient point of view is brought in to break the dramatic suspense. And there will be less intellectual uneasiness in Coating Booth, which is quite a departure from Shakespeare's original flavor. Uh, the third example is, is Hamlet's image in the two productions. So in the two pr opera productions of Hamlet, more information is encoded in the images and visual effects. There's a fascinating interplay between the source text and the media xichu. The Peking opera version of Hamlet is dressed in royal and military costume having two very long peasant tail feathers on his helmet, um, as you can see in the picture, symbolizing military arts and rank. A pair of archery sleeves, as you can see here, though not very clearly, um, symbolizing mastery of martial arts, in a dragon robe, symbolizing his royal birth, and the few accoutrements of a warrior. <coughs> As you can see in the final scene, symbolizing the identity of a commander or a leading general in battlefield. And the previous picture shows his uh, martial arts. Though Hamlet is a courtier, soldier, and scholar in the eye of Ophelia, and Hamlet speaks of himself as the opposite of Hercules. This Shichu Hamlet in image is explicitly more masculine than the Hamlet in verse. More interestingly, the warrior images and the physical gestures are not neutral in Chinese theater, but have connotations of moral judgment, leading the audience to admire or to be repelled by the character. And in this production, in this case, the visual elements predefine Hamlet as a warrior defend, defending justice. However, in the Yue opera version, the other version of Hamlet, the prince is dressed in white silk, silk robe, and has in his hand a bamboo fan, uh, with which the actor dances as him in white silk robe. With the bamboo fan, in a certain scene, the actor dances and gestures in the to-be-or-not-to-be soliloquy. When Hamlet thinks aloud and by, uh, by a, and by a sleeve to say we end the heartache and the southern natural charms that flashes out to, the movement of the fan reminds the audience of the fragile beauty of life. For a fan is an unpractical accessory to a man of letters, and being in use for only one of the four seasons of the year, it symbolizes transience in some contexts. Such a scholar in white with a fan is often the hero of a traditional Chinese drama. The robe and the fan are symbols associated with poetry, elegance, and eruditeness. The prince uses imagery in his opening speech to reinforce the contract between, uh, sorry, the contrast, uh, the contrast between his clean conscience and the incestuous world, saying that the mountains and rivers are weeping and he'd pursue bright moonshine and fresh breeze. By the visual images and the images in his word, the Yue opera Hamlet is defined as a pure-hearted scholar, though not like a Wittenberg scholar in the original, on seeing the scholarly Hamlet, some savvy audience may be amused to remember how Hamlet comments on his own poetry. I am ill at these numbers, I have no art to reckon my grounds to Ophelia. The valetudinarian and graceful image is a moral metaphor of conscience struggling against the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune in that context. So the Xichu elements in the three media production, uh, products bring in old metaphors for contemporary audience to interpret. Images in Richard III 
draw the Shakespearean sto story closer to the logic of ancient Chinese history. The Peking Opera image and the Yue Opera image of Hamlet, along with the image of the God of Justice, help to make explicit the moral judgment. Though the two Hamlets seem to be opposed to each other, one valiant and warrior-like, the other valetudinarian and scholarly, thus opening up more space for interpretations. <coughs> If the Peking Opera image hints at the willpower to take arms against the sea of troubles and the heroic sacrifice, the image of the Yue Opera Hamlet is associated with the defending of the unblemished essence of man in a, <coughs> in a charmingly archaic style. Now I'm going to further discuss um, the problem in the audience. It is called the bifurcation of audience awareness. As is demonstrated by the cross-cultural productions, the images bring out more, more meanings than the words, since Qi Chu has a rich storage of artistic patterns and encoded motifs. However, what we just discussed is the idealistic interpretation of the Xi Chu images. So I'm going to deconstruct my own talk. Um, in reality, the interpretation of the media products might not be unified because the role of the audience is complicated by taste, cultural awareness, and familiarity with Shakespeare and Xi Chu tradition. I remember a friend from England asked me a question that a savvy Xi Chu fan would never have thought of. He asked, could the God of Justice be conspiring with others to conceal the truth um, it was interesting to think when a Xi Chu connoisseur knows that God of Justice presents an omniscient point of view, that scene remains a suspense in an outsider's eye, or we may call that friend an insider, for he knows the suspense in Shakespeare's original. Similarly, though it is encoded in the costume and gestures of the Peking opera Hamlet, that he is a warrior of high military skills, those who are new in a Xi Chu theater could still interpret his image and movements with no pre-assumptions, which makes it easier for the newcomers to, to feel pity and fear for Hamlet and meanwhile marvel at the actor's skills. It may be so with most of the traditional arts, not just uh, Chinese operas, it may be so that the conventions become more and more unfamiliar to contemporary people. But the Xi Chu tradition in China have been, especially in mainland China, have been more seriously alienated in our time because since the early 20th century there had been an anxiety among Chinese intellectuals to reform the traditional theatre. Prominent scholars launched pungent criticism against the themes and aesthetics of traditional drama in their articles. According to the reformers, the remedy for the withering Chinese drama was the scripts and theories of Western <coughs> drama. Um, here I could have quoted a lot of scholars from that period of time. So in that context, Shakespeare with Ibsen and Bernard Shaw became one of the parallels for Chinese dramatists. To propagate new ideas, Xi Chu's theatre went on to be minimized and standard in the 1960s and 1970s. Many of the conventions criticized and abandoned. What a pity. So in the 1980s, in a new cultural phase in mainland China, when the traditional theater was revived, it was difficult to bridge the gap between the artistry of Xi Chu and the, the youth who had never been exposed to it. Even Shakespeare's plots were adopted as carriers of the artistry of Xi Chu. For the, the youth are more familiar with Shakespeare than with traditional theater. So many directors were conscious of redefining national values in the world. But now the problem is that the mid-aged and young generations of audience 
are estranged from the theatrical traditions and cannot understand the meanings in the conventions. In that context, when a Shakespeare play is staged in Xichu, the Shakespearean elements may appear more familiar than the Xichu elements to a large proportion of audience. To international audience, the cross-cultural productions provide new perspectives on Shakespeare. To the young generation of Chinese audience, the productions may be the first chance to get access to the traditions of Xichu. To them, the visual effects are powerfully strange and new, probably giving rise to a sudden recognition that the art of Xichu is so surprisingly good. To them, the hero is, um, in quotation marks, is singular, and they can identify with him. And that partly explains why both actors of the Yue Opera and Peking Opera Hamlet became popular with the young audience in China, especially with university students. But to the old Sabi Xichu audience, the hero is, in quotation marks, plural. For the Xichu elements in the productions suggest allusions and conventions or even reproduction. For example, a scene featuring Hamlet riding on horseback with Horatio on his way to find the ghost in the Peking Opera production, in the eyes of a savvy audience, may be just a repetition or reproduction of a scene from a previous famous Peking Opera production. From these two pictures, you can see the similarities. Um, and that old Peking Opera production is called Qin Chung, Scouting the Battlefield. So Qin Chung is, uh, sorry, uh, the Peking Opera Hamlet is exactly like the posture of Qin Chung. The similarities um, in this case are so very obvious. So in that sense, the audience of a cross-cultural media production is much stratified not so much by their knowledge of Hamlet as by their degree of familiarity with the tradition of Qi Chu. So I've discussed the distortion and addition of meaning in the adaptations and the bifurcation of audience. Now I try to arrive at a tentative conclusion, um, which is called an attitude. I was concerned with the loss and distortion of the Shakespearean elements when the texts of the plays were transposed to performances. And I wrote articles to discuss the loss of Shakespeare and ambiguity in the Xichu adaptations. Um, I'm also concerned with the bifurcation of audience and the difficulties in reaching a full, a so-called full appreciation. But now I realize the cross-cultural productions are not merely performances, but phenomena. To fully understand them, we, we may need to take into consideration literature, art, audience, social trends, and perhaps technology and market. I felt regret for the loss of the Shakespearean subtleties and for the unrecognized Xichu patterns, but some discussion on how to treat long-standing national traditions in the framework of world literature gave me an inspiration. Uh, as David Damrosch responded to a similar question in the introduction to his What is World Literature? Uh, he's with the idea that works of world literature take on a new life as they move into the world at large. Having two dimensions, location in history and dispersal across time and space, both Shakespeare and the Xichu tradition ought to be appreciated as at once locally inflected and translocally mobile. Therefore, we don't face a strict either or choice between total immersion and an airy vapidity. For the new generations, both Shakespeare and the Xichu conventions are materials based on which they will reimagine the story that is not necessarily Shakespearean and redevelop their artistic imagination 
that is not necessarily Chinese. Isn't it another proof that Shakespeare is our contemporary?